So I have a short period of time here where I hope to um, really provide more of a framework or a different way of thinking about much of what we've talked about today. <clears throat> I don't think anything I say will uh, be intended to contradict or replace anything anybody else has said, but perhaps um, allow you to understand or see uh, some of the issues we've talked about in a slightly different way. Many, many, many years ago, a great bird brought the Navajo people from the north to the land in which they currently live. That great bird landed on the plains of New Mexico, and you're looking at a picture of it right now. It's currently known by Americans as the ship rock. The Navajo call this the rock with wings. After this bird landed, the Navajos lived on the ship rock for many years. The only reason they would come down, they would follow a trail down from the rock, was to plant their fields and to get water. And then one day the peak was struck by lightning. The lightning obliterated the trail, leaving only a sheer cliff, which you can see here. Unfortunately, that stranded the women and children on top, and ultimately they starved to death. So that's the story the Navajo tell about this mountain. If you move into the year 2015, the Navajo will tell you that this is one of their sacred mountains. Part of the reason this is a sacred mountain is that their ancestors, those women and children who died on top of that mountain, their ghosts continue to exist there. Now in the 1920s and the 1930s, the rock climbing community considered the ship rock to be a problem to be solved. There were many who felt this was an unclimbable rock and much time and effort was spent trying to find a way to the top. Ultimately, it was first climbed in the 1930s and since that time uh, has become one of those mountains that rock climbers covet. Um, it's currently listed in a book called The 50 Great Rock Climbs in North America and to this day rock climbers uh, will head to New Mexico uh, to climb the ship rock. Geologists describe this mountain in a different way. If you ask a geologist what the ship rock is, they will tell you it's composed of fractured volcanic brescia and black dikes of igneous rock called manette. It's an erosional remnant of the throat of an old volcano and the volcanic brescia that formed in a diatreme. This all occurred approximately 27 million years ago. It occurred underground, and the only reason we see the ship rock today is that the harder rock has remained after the earth around it has eroded. Now, there's a dispute about the ship rock. In, 19, in the 1960s, the Navajo Nation made it illegal to climb the ship rock. What the Navajo believe is that you don't attempt to climb any of their sacred mountains, but they feel particularly strongly about the ship rock. And the reason is that they feel if people go to the top of the ship rock, they disturb the ghosts of those ancestors who died uh, eons ago when the lightning struck the mountain. So the Navajo feel very strongly that this mountain should not be climbed, and yet the rock climber community feels very differently about this mountain. There is clearly a disagreement. There is clearly a different way of understanding how we should behave toward this mountain between different groups. What I'm going to suggest is that um, it is one way of trying to understand these disagreements. And, um, uh, this is just one illustration of a disagreement that I think illustrates the framework I'm about to present, uh, but most of the disagreements we face in clinical medicine are similar. What I'm going to suggest is that when we talk about morality, 
Uh, we usually focus on the third bullet point there, which is action and response. <clears throat> Ethicists attempt to determine what the right thing to do is. How should we respond to this situation? What I'm going to suggest, and this is certainly consistent with what our two previous speakers have been talking about, um, is that our action and responses, the decisions we come to about what the right thing to do is, are very powerfully based in the two prior bullets, character and identity and vision. Um, those are also, by the way, the things that result in implicit biases um, and stereotypes and so on. Now, how does that play out with the Navajo and the rock climbers? If you think about the character and identity part of this, that's really quite simply the, the answer to the question, who am I? Uh, you know, what are my role identities and what does that mean to me in, in sort of a moral sense? If you are a Navajo, this is a sacred mountain to you. And you behave certain ways when you see this mountain. You don't climb this mountain. You revere this mountain. It's important to your culture. It, it's essential to your identity as a Navajo. When you're a rock climber, this is also an important icon to you because it represents a challenge. And the rock climbing community looks at the ship rock and it goes against every bone in their body not to climb this mountain uh, because it poses a formidable challenge uh, and it's the sort of challenge that a rock climber has a very difficult time um, uh, resisting. The geologist would actually like to take a sample from this mountain <laughs> and, and uh, uh, do analysis on that. A photographer, on the other hand, is likely to circle this mountain looking for the best lighting and the best vantage point from which to photograph it. Um, the identities of those people have a profound impact on the way they respond uh, in terms of their behavioral um, uh, responses to this mountain. Vision is another very powerful part of this. Now, vision is clearly related to one's identity and character. Um, but by vision, I mean uh, the way you sort of see and understand the world. And, and much of this is fairly unconscious and occurs at a subconscious level. Uh, the discussions we just had on implicit bias illustrate that very nicely. When you are walking down the street and see someone of color, you see something that may not be accurate. And, and it, although we can all sort of describe something very similar as when we look at the ship rock, the reality is that our vision invests what we're seeing with our eyes with meaning, and that meaning alters our behavior. When the Navajo looks at the ship rock, they see a sacred mountain. They see a place where their ancestors' ghosts rest. When the rock climber looks at the ship rock, they see a formidable challenge. When the photographer looks at the ship rock, they see an aesthetic opportunity to capture that mountain in a certain way on film. And based on their vision, the way they see this mountain, their behavior uh, changes. The photographer drives around the mountain in a circle. The rock climber heads straight for the mountain and goes for the top the Navajo stands back in awe. Vision is a powerful reason that people disagree about ethical issues. Frequently, if you hear people talk about ethical issues, you will hear them describing things that sound very different from what some, the person who disagrees with them is describing. Uh, we talked a little bit this morning about making sure that your facts are accurate. One of the things we have to understand is that facts can also be altered in ways where they're invested with meaning and value. The use of the terms and the language we use uh, has a powerful impact on the way we see and understand issues. A more lighthearted way of understanding this is a story that's frequently told about a battleship that's out at sea on maneuvers and the captain is concerned as nightfall approaches and a fog has settled in and visibility decreases. So he goes up and asks his um, lookout how things are 
playing out. And the lookout says, well, I'm concerned that there's a light on our starboard bow, and I think we're on a collision course with that ship. And so the captain says, well, signal that ship to change course 20 degrees. So the lookout does that, flashes the lights to change course 20 degrees using Morse code, and the lights flash back, you change course 20 degrees. Well, the captain, not very happy about being disobeyed, says, signal that ship, I'm a captain, change course 20 degrees immediately. The lookout follows the order, the lights flash back, I'm a seaman second class, somebody who's clearly outranked by a captain, you change course 20 degrees. So the captain, who you might now argue is blinded by fury, says, signal that ship, I'm a battleship, change course immediately. The light flashes back, I'm a lighthouse. <laughs> there will be a change in behavior here, <clears throat> and it's going to come from the person who has the highest rank. What needed to happen in this particular situation, where we had a clear disagreement about what the right answer was, was for the captain to have his vision corrected. As long as the captain believed this was another ship, he wasn't going to back down. He was not seeing things clearly. He needed his vision corrected. corrected. And in many cases, disagreements um, revolve around understandings that are either different or in some cases inaccurate about a certain situation. So let me tell you about a young man who um, sought care for what was ultimately diagnosed as acute lymphocytic leukemia. This man's father had recently immigrated from Russia, and after the oncologist sat down and talked with uh, the boy and his father about his diagnosis, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and the um, uh, treatment options and the outcomes, the father said, uh, I don't want my son treated. It took several days for the oncologist to get to the bottom of this, to understand why the father was refusing, but ultimately, uh, to the best of his ability, the oncologist was able to discern that this father had had at least two other family members back in Russia who had been diagnosed with cancer treated with chemotherapy, and ultimately were determined to never have had cancer in the first place. And his, so he was convinced, because of this past experience, that his son also probably did not have cancer, that the doctors were wrong, and he was not about to let his son be exposed to toxic uh, medications. Stalemate. What do you do in a stalemate? You consult ethics. So ethics comes in and my first question to the oncologist was, well, how long do you have to work with this family before the outcome, the prognosis decreases to a point where it's no longer acceptable? And the answer was maybe a week to 10 days. So I said, you have a week to 10 days to convince the family because we're not going to get a CPS referral. We're not going to go to court until we've exhausted that avenue. So when we look at that sort of situation, <clears throat> that disagreement we have over treatment, we can look to ethical principles, like the principle of beneficence, which says that we should seek the good of our patient. We have an obligation to seek the good of our patient. We should avoid the infliction of unnecessary harms, prevent harms, and promote goods. And there's no question that what we do in medicine and nursing and occupational therapy and speech therapy and nutrition and everything else we do in a hospital is applied beneficence. And it's easy to look at a case like this and say, well, it's, the answer from beneficence is clear here. It, it clearly is the right thing to have this child treated for his cancer. And the shortcut then is to simply go to a judge and get a court order to have this child treated. What we need to understand is that um, the parent in this case is applying the principle of beneficence as well. 
Because based on this, what this parent understands, on the way this parent is seeing this situation, the best thing for his son is not to be exposed to toxic chemicals. This father has had two previous experiences with cancer, and in neither case were the physicians correct. Getting to the bottom of this case, first and foremost, requires understanding how the father sees this situation. It's the only way you're going to resolve this situation in, an, in a way that doesn't involve significant conflict and coercion. The bottom line is that it may look one way to us, but it looks very different to the father. Now, the kinds of disagreements we face in clinical pediatrics frequently fall into one of two categories. It's either like this case, where you have a parent who declines something that we've medically recommended, or in some cases, a parent who requests a medical intervention that the clinician does not feel is indicated. And I would suggest that these two kinds of disagreements are really different kinds of disagreements and our way of thinking about them should be different. For parents who decline a recommended treatment, so we have this father from Russia who is refusing to allow his child to be treated for cancer. We need to first recognize that that medical people have no authority to treat a child without parental permission unless they have some authorization from the state to do so. Which means that from a practical perspective, whether we agree with this father's decision or not, our only avenue to force treatment is to get the state involved. Communication and persuasion are really our only tools short of that, and they're tools that should be exercised to their outer limits before we seek a more coercive method. And diagnosing the parent's reasons for refusal can be very helpful. Does it solve the problem all of the time? No, but it can be very helpful in coming up with creative solutions that may resolve a conflict like this one. Ultimately, you may need to decide whether you're going to involve the state. And so I will tell you that when I get consulted on a case like this, I frequently make a decision right up front. Is this the sort of case where I would interfere with this parent's decision as opposed to letting this child die from cancer? And in this case, the answer was yes, I would. So when I told the oncologist, you've got a week, I had already decided because this child had something like an 85% chance of cure um, with standard treatment, I had already decided that this was the sort of case that we would bring to a judge or in which we would involve CPS. But it's not the first stop. The first stop is, let's see if we can get this father to maybe understand this situation in a way uh, where he agrees with our recommendations instead of using the coercive approach, which won't be good for anybody. And these are the sorts of conditions I think need to be met before you involve the state. The parent's action, in this case a refusal to treat with chemotherapy, has to place the child at a significant risk of harm that's both serious and eminent. That eminent criterion allowed me to give the oncologist a week. So there was some degree of eminence, but it wasn't eminent enough to call CPS on day one. The interference has to be necessary to prevent harm. It has to be likely to prevent the harm. In other words, it has to be of proven efficacy. We're not talking about experimental therapies here. And it can't be associated with a similar risk of similarly serious harms. There should be no less intrusive alternatives, and in this case, you do have a week to attempt less intrusive alternatives, in other words, persuasion. Uh, and then finally, I apply the test of generalizability, which is my way of trying to um, counter some of the implicit biases that may arise in cases like this. And so what I ask myself is, if this parent was just like me, somebody who was a professor at the university, white, middle class, speaks without an accent, would I still, based on these facts, involve a judge, go to CPS? If the answer is no, then you need to ask yourself why. Finally, the test of publicity is simply my way of um, uh, sort of um, maybe getting the risk managers on, on board. 
Um, and, and that is to say, if these parents go to the press, am I comfortable with that because I feel I can defend the decision to involve the state in this case? In other words, what do I feel that, as a general rule, the public would support our uh, coercive approach? Now, the other sort of um, type of case is when parents make requests that we don't agree with. And in this case, we actually have a little more authority because it's not about touching a child without consent. In this case, we're being asked to do some, something that, in some cases, we may feel has the potential to harm a child. Um, and in that case, we have much more leeway to say yes or no. And what I would suggest in those sorts of cases is that we consider accommodating parents when the intervention will not harm the child, when it won't significantly harm others, and when the potential benefit is possible but maybe not necessarily established at a level um, of scientific certainty that we would uh, normally accept. But it is appropriate to limit interventions to those within the scope of a provider's practice or standard of care. So if somebody is asking me for something uh, that I don't think is gonna hurt the child but I lack familiarity with, um, I will simply tell them that I can't provide that um, because it's not something within my scope of practice. Now let's go back to our clinical case. So how did this get resolved? Day nine we are starting to turn the wheels to do what it takes to get a court order. We're starting to think about who we need to notify within the institution. And the oncologist at that point brings the father down to the pathology lab, sits him in front of a microscope with the pathologist and shows him his son's blood with its leukemic cells. And then he shows him the textbook that shows normal cells. And then he shows him the page in the textbook that shows leukemic cells. And they go back and forth from his son's cells to the textbook. And the father turns to the oncologist and says, my son has leukemia, you need to treat him. It's a beautiful example of recognizing that we needed to change the father's way of seeing and understanding the situation. We needed to change his vision, and once his vision was changed, the conflict went away without involving the coercive force of the state. Moral differences are not just different choices given the same facts, they're differences of vision. Moral views are less the product of reasoning and more the result of an image, a slogan, and a metaphor. The bottom line is that many of our moral beliefs, many of the conclusions we come to, are actually shaped by the way we see and understand the world. And it's important for us to recognize that. It's not always the patient's vision that needs to be corrected. Sometimes it's our own. And so we need to be aware of the fact that we come with just as many encumbrances on our ability to see the world broadly and differently as our patients do. One of my favorite sections from C.S. Lewis's Narnia Chronicles uh, comes in The Magician's Nephew, and what has happened in this book at this point is the children who have discovered this magical land of Narnia um, have found a door into this country. And they, back home, they are sort of being kept captive by their evil Uncle Andrew, um, so to speak. And Andrew, as they escape through this door in an attempt to escape from Andrew, he manages to grab the coat of one of the kids and he finds himself in Narnia with the children. Now, Narnia is inhabited by a godlike figure named Aslan, who is a lion. And the lion represents the good and he's fighting the evil forces in their land. And what happens in this scene is that the lion begins to sing, and Uncle Andrew is disturbed by this because this does not fit his frame of reference. Lions don't sing, they roar. And so he refuses to believe that the lion is singing. 
And so what C.S. Lewis says at this point is we must now go back a bit and explain what the whole scene had looked like from Uncle Andrew's point of view. So what C.S. Lewis is illustrating here is an important diagnostic technique. We may have our own point of view, but it's important to understand the point of view of the person who sees things differently. And then he, he goes on to say, for what you see in here depends a good deal on where you're standing. It also depends on what sort of person you are. And what C.S. Lewis is talking about there really is vision and character and integrity. Now what he says in the next sentence about Uncle Andrew is one of my favorite lines because what he says is, now the trouble with trying to make yourself stupider than you really are is that you very often succeed. <laughs> and then he says, Uncle Andrew did. So what I would suggest is we all need to recognize that we see the world in um, ways that are different than many other people. And that doesn't mean that our way of understanding and seeing the world is necessarily the correct one. Sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not. But we all see the world within different frames. And perhaps the most important thing is for us to understand that and to try to understand how the ways we've been trained, the ways we've been brought up, impact the way we understand the world. But it's also important as we diagnose and treat patients that we take the time to understand why they may disagree with us from time to time. What it is about the way they're seeing the situation in the world um, that leads to that disagreement. And then ask ourselves if there is some way of bringing those two together. The reality is that many of the conflicts we face will remain incontrovertible conflicts unless we can get people at least seeing and understanding the situation in a way that's similar. Thank you.